Hello everyone, good afternoon. So today is about cost estimating in, in projects and we're going to, today we're going to look at some fundamental reasons for cost overrun and I'm going to ask you to try and be a little bit creative and think about cost overruns for three different UAVs I've identified very generic things um, some UAV examples then we're going to look at different uh, ways cost information is used in projects and again, I'm going to ask you for some examples, work together in, in groups. And then we're going to look at fundamentally what the estimating process is in a project. So what happens, what, what should happen, what are the steps. And we'll look at a few examples of estimating methods. So how do people estimate the cost of, say, the Airbus, the Airbus A380 at product configuration stage, for example or the project cost for the Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier at, um, at initial stages of project development or very detailed cost estimates say for a composite process in aerospace maybe you're trying to drill holes in the wings which have come from Broughton in Chester uh, maybe Chester the Broughton factory uh, has sent the main the main wings, which is uh, famously down a riverway or a canalway, where a bridge has been adapted for the, uh, for the assemblies to pass through that waterway successfully, for example. And then we'll look at um, uncertainty and risk in cost as well. And I've got, I've got some software from Palisade where we can have a look at a practical example of how you would develop a Monte Carlo cost risk estimate in industry if you were developing a cost estimate under uncertainty. So we're going we're gonna to do those things, hopefully with lots of examples as well. So I think you've all seen, you've all seen examples of, of cost overruns, there's some, been some very famous ones, some not so famous ones. The Nimrod example, for example, um, there's lots of supply chain difficulty in terms of cost overrun. HS2, in terms of the sheer complexity of the project, so many moving parts, so many different suppliers to manage, so many different bits of engineering to manage. So there's lots of reasons for cost overrun. Maybe to introduce cost, um, I could just skim across some of the examples from my career. My, my first escapade in cost was estimating the cost of composites for Airbus and Rolls-Royce at manufacturing level and that was looking at um, I guess in particular process time process time estimation for different for different processes uh, which were new so there was these different ways of forming bits of plastic to form complex shapes indeed it was found later on that some of these so-called lighter parts were heavier for the same strength to weight ratio. But there was a particular process called the automating tape laying process, which is basically a computer numerically controlled machine, which moved back and two across a wing laying composite fiber tape, making a plastic, plastic main plane or wing as they say. Um, so developing the manufacturing process level cost information was, was our project. And also using AI as well, 
We also used some cost estimation software from a place called Cognition, or Cognition Europe, who, um, who do the cost management for Airbus. And they're a company who, in industry, lots of these cost estimates are developed in Excel spreadsheets. And somewhere as complex an organisation as, um, as Airbus in Filton, based in Bristol, also in France, Toulouse, where they do the assembly, um, and other places, they tend to have lots of these, these spreadsheet level cost estimates. And Cognition is a software which links them all together. It fundamentally takes all the cost estimates at spreadsheet level and links cells within the Excel spreadsheets. So that's a, a, major, a major task. Um, I think that was before the time, I think Airbus lost a whole warehouse full of servers at one point, which was a risk event, which caused a tremendous amount of uh, disruption. Then, you know, then I was looking at life cycle cost. And, you know, full life cycle cost is, uh, you know, the, the, the cost of manufacture, design manufacture, in service and disposal fundamentally. The US Department of Defense used to say, look, we, we need to be thinking about full life cycle cost because 80% of a total system cost is, um, uh, is in the use stage. So we're busy acquiring defense equipment and it's costing us more in using it than actually acquiring it. So we need to be involved in the full life cycle management, uh, cost management of these things. So I did a lot of that um, with the advent of different contracts coming into defense based around the full life cycle, which is why full life cycle cost nowadays is really, really critical. And now sustainability cost, cost to the environment of things, social cost. We saw recently in the news that uh, you know, the water uh, utilities have again uh, dumped a load of sewage into the sea. So that's, that will cost society a certain amount of money. Um, in all sorts of aspects. Maybe lost opportunity costs in terms of fishing, lost opportunity costs in terms of tourism, um, and so on. So the lack of investment from the water industry will cause societal costs and sustainability costs in perhaps cleaning up some of that mess. Maybe it leads to some sort of algae and lack of biodiversity. So there's all sorts of implications of that. And then I, I moved into cost risk and cost uncertainty and that's where you've got cost information for the full life cycle where you have to model the uncertainty and risk in that cost information to support decision making for the full life cycle. So one, one of the decisions you'd support is the Ministry of Defence would not buy aircraft anymore. They'd contract for the availability of the Lightning Fleet. 80% of the Lightning Fleet must be available at 8 o'clock in the morning every day and there'll be a contract for that called an availability contract. And to enable that, you need to be able to estimate full life cycle cost information, in, including maintenance cost, cost of designing in reliability. So the more reliable a system is, the less maintenance you'll do. So the whole, the whole game changes with that sort of contract. So this, this advent of the, the defense industry, in fact, most industries going towards we're not buying things now, we're going to lease it from people. Even cars, you see car hire has increased, and say luxury cars and different things, they now provide the capability to drive a Bentley or drive an Aston Martin, rather than actually fully own it. So you can actually lease a car for a certain period of time. And part of that contract is to, is to support that, so, so, for example, if you break down in the middle of Australia and, you know, your Aston Martin is there near, a, near a Ayers Rock, then uh, what would happen is you would have a, a, con a clause in the contract where after 24 hours they'll be able to get that part to you and get the, get the car moving again. So that's, that has a cost implication. So that, perhaps that's some of, some of my background. So here's some fundamental reasons for cost increases. I want you to start to think about these. I'm going to ask you to apply them in a second to a particular uh, set of scenarios. 
which one you choose which one you choose is up to you but these are typical examples where you do get cost overrun so we've talked about complexity already if something's got lots of moving parts there's more opportunity for things to go wrong and that includes abstract things like your suppliers if you have lots of suppliers they're very difficult to manage and coordinate that's why people like Nissan or, uh, or Volkswagen Volkswagen have their supplier villages where their supply chain is actually on the doorstep of Volkswagen themselves there's not much not much distance to travel if things go wrong coordination is is made more immediate and you have these supply chain management specialists who form a close relationship with each supplier and they work to improve each supplier and get them to reduce the cost of things using cost improvement ideas so complexity is a is, is, a, is a, a, a probably a top example the major the major cost driver uh, in terms of cost increases is engineering changes every time you have to make a change in a project you have to incur lots of change management processes lots of redesign lots of real disruption and if you've got a complex a complex project there's a lot of there's a lot of threads to untangle to make that change there's the famous um, thing with the typhoon aircraft where it's probably one of the most integrated systems uh, in aircraft although that support that goes against that goes against aircraft design principles in terms of what you want is, is modularity in aircraft design what you need is something which is lots of independent parts you want to minimize the number of dependencies in terms of electronic software uh, mechanical linkages these sorts of things so if you do change parts of the aircraft like the landing gear or the canopy or some part of the control system it's a localized change rather than something which really impacts the whole of the aircraft and causes major cost major cost additions so engineering changes is 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 the biggest cost driver and the, the UK government made a change from between air to air and air to ground which is a fundamental capability change and the impact on the aircraft was uh, was quite dramatic considering the level of integration and the reason why it was integrated because we're in the business of high performance and to get the most performance out of the aircraft led to a decision for all these integrated systems another thing about you'll find in defense aircraft when you try and boot uh, an aircraft control it'll be something like Windows 311 it'll be a really old version of Windows operating system it won't be the latest high technology software because Windows 311 we kind of know everything about it and it's more reliable so one of the design parameters of a, of a military aircraft is to have really reliable operating system software so there is a market for Windows 311 and it's in the it's in the defense industry for all the kit they make things with um, long project durations imply high uncertainty and I've, I've got an example of that uh, soon but uh, if you're trying to estimate the support cost for an aircraft carrier 20 years from now can you can you predict anything in five years in three years four years what's going to happen to a ship I mean one of, one of the things which is really problematic is some of Portsmouth dock cannot support some of the engineering equipment for aircraft carriers you know, um, if you berth a ship at Portsmouth then some of the dock will collapse if you put some of the some of the disassembly equipment on the side to try and take the ship apart it just can't do it so there are only certain ports in the world where you can do maintenance of, of a certain type so you've got to think about the timing of where the ship is in the world when you've got to do the maintenance all these things are uncertain um, and even the type of upgrade you're going to do to improve system capability so all these things uh, impact there's your politics impact cost one of the um, things we have now in terms of legislation that even the defense industry are having to think about sustainability many years ago it was something called the we directive which was about the disposal of electrical and electronic equipment 
And that really was a major cost driver for that sort of industry because now we had to think about how we're going to dispose of this stuff we're making. So there's all this uh, reasons for, for cost overrun uh, and probably many more. The classic one is the level of uncertainty you have about something. I mean, you can have random uncertainty or you can have just lack of knowledge. You just have lack of information, especially at work package level where you've only got so much um, feedback about the design, about the implications of the design, the work itself. So lots of the time you lack information to make any sort of decisions or, or cost information predictions. So this leads on to my first kind of experiment in getting things to work. Correct. Yes. Yep. So, so, well, in, in politics, you can see you can see the implications of the leveling up agenda at the moment. Um, you know, you've got uh, this thing for HS2. We want as much capability of travel as we can to improve the economics. You know, the Northern powerhouse. But well, because of economic, because of political decisions in terms of balancing the budget, there's been a major risk, a major unknown unknown. Then they've, they've kind of scaled back on that. And the reason for that as well is the level of complexity in the engineering. Um, and perhaps the supply capability may cause further cost overrun. And also the one about lack of capability of people. When, when the two aircraft carriers were being built in the UK, there were not enough welders to do the job. There had to be um, some level of training to get the, a number of qualified, skilled welders to work on two major aircraft carriers. So political decisions are quite critical in causing cost, cost overruns. So, I, so there's, there are a number of fundamental reasons there. Could you apply them to this... Uh, to this situate any of these scenarios. So the first one is a student project. You know, there was a problem with the National Physical Laboratory, the NPL, who, uh, who were responsible in the UK for uh, metrics, measurements, uh, weights, distances, these sorts of things. They do lots of uh, research on metrology, but they, can, they cannot estimate how long it takes them to develop their own software to any sort of credibility. And we're talking about software in teams of three or four people. So they're doing a project at the NPL. They might be developing some sort of laser system which measures geometries um, in a manufacturing company or a, or a factory. And they can't develop their own software. They can't say how long it's going to take them. They just can't do it. It's just so much uncertainty and subjectivity. It's not very easy. So a student project say, where's the, where's the causes of overrun in your student project if you were making a UAV? Or the scenario with a utilities inspection drone, or perhaps the Northrop Grumman Global Hawk RQ4? If you try and be a little bit creative and think about what could be reasons, some practical reasons for that overrun, and hopefully my Padlet will be working. I think I found a reason for a potential Yep. People get too overcomplicated with costs and the cost. As in saying you want your drone to perform like you want it to, so you get these components. They ultimately end up being too expensive and you have to increase your budget. Yes, there's, there's, there's this thing is this thing called scope creep where people they start to add little incremental It'd be nice if this would happen, but under the radar. It's not being monitored or validated by any management system. I've seen this in, in software where someone says, can you just put a button here which gives us access to this information? And it could take a programmer the best part of six months to do something 
which on the surface looks very simple, but incurs a lot of cost. Well, yes, there's, there's um, one of the reasons for getting cost information is to do supplier negotiation. So you need to negotiate with your suppliers to get the correct price. And if you're operating under uncertainty and a particular type of contract, then things can go over budget quite easily. I'm sorry, I've just got to um, log in, otherwise I can't get to the Padlet. Yeah, so, so usually it's, uh, you need a supply chain management system. There's ways your supply chain can let you down. Um, they can go over cost. You can marshal them with contracts, but that again, they may have clauses in that contract. So it's about sharing the risk at times. But if you're sharing the risk, you're sharing the pain. So that can happen. So are you, are you able to access the Padlet through your devices? If I just show the... So you should be able to follow that link or type that link in. Let's hope that works. So you should be able to, you get these little post -it, electronic post-it notes and you're able to write down some creative scenarios to reflect those, those major points, those major points at the beginning. You don't have to be, I'm just looking for the principle really, you don't have to know anything really technical about this area at all. Just think about how things may, may or may not cause a cost overrun. Uncertainty is a really common one. You just, you just don't have the knowledge, you don't have the information to enable you to, to understand situations. As I say, it can be random information, you know, a bit like uh, in the same nature as you flick a coin and you don't know whether something's going to be heads or tails. So there's, a, there's always random uncertainty and there's, there's always lack of knowledge. You don't have the full design details or you don't have full visibility or knowledge of the project. It's just an imperfect world in terms of having information. Is that working? Have we got, has anyone managed to get in? I don't know whether I... Uh, I kept this slide back because I didn't want everyone seeing the activities. But uh, Is it working? It won't do it. It's the first time I'm trying this system. Uh, let's just see. Uh, it's a university thing. Let's just see. Why is this not working? Do I have to do something? Let's 
So the, the process of supplier negotiation. So sometimes you can, be, you can be with a supplier and say, this is what we're going to charge. They say it's going to be half a million pounds. And you say, can you break that down? Could you break that down into material, labour and overhead? And they might say, no, because we're, we're the only supplier. We're monopolising you. It's going to be half a million. So they, they, they put their profit in. That may be a very poor negotiation technique because they won't get the project next time. But uh, they can do that sort of leverage. And I've seen that with a component called a magnetron in the healthcare industry, which is part of a scanner. Um, they had to pay the company anything they liked because they're the only person who made that. And it was, a, it was an old design which they hadn't changed. So um, I think this is... Uh, can I post this? This has really put damnation onto me. So you can't you can't access this. You have to be a member of Padlet. Is anyone getting any success? Hmm. Okay, we're going to have to go to manual. <laughs> Sorry, I forget this fix for next week. It's a new system. Has anyone got any ideas? Scenario for any of these, any cost increases? I think we've had one with the suppliers. With the uh, price negotiations. Sometimes suppliers go bankrupt as well, which, is, which I guess is a risk. It's a risk event. What about technology maturity? Maybe, maybe in this Northrop Grumman Global Hawk, they're betting on a propulsion system, which is new. Yes? Yep. Yes, yeah, certainly. Do you mean like for, say, Donald Trump versus Biden or something like that? What happens if, you know, we've got a conflict at the moment in Europe? Will they up the budget now? Will they try and renovate things? Just imagine, you know, you know your colleagues, you're trying to coordinate, if you're trying to co coordinate your colleagues in the quadcopter and they get lots of different things to do and they disappear, or they get, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why their availability is, is affected. So all of a sudden everything starts to proliferate because you've got complexity. One person is dependent on another person to communicate. He's dependent on this person to communicate. He's suddenly unavailable. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly what happens. You, you try to be scientific about it, and you try to predict risks, but it's easier to just add on a percentage, because it's uncertain anyway. But uh, it, it, people like BA Systems, they do break it down into risks and uncertainties and use Monte Carlo. 
But for, but for unknown unknowns, things you don't know you don't know, which is a management reserve, then they usually use a rule of thumb for that industry. So they use their experience to gauge that and as well trying to think of the environment, what's happening. Uh, one, of, one, of the biggest risk, or one of the biggest sources of uncertainty is the people going through your project. You might be changing people on the quadcopter. Just imagine that at your level, your, your localised visibility. It happens the same on the Global Hawk. You're going to get umpteen people walking through the project. They'll be there for a year, then they'll go. And you don't, you know, they carry that expertise with them and they leave the project. And they, they might not have recorded what they've done in any sort of detail and suddenly you lose information and things go wrong. Things start to increase in cost. Um, I think with the, there was something I was going to say about the Northrop Grumman. Yeah, as well, nowadays the, the military effort is becoming more technological. Less people, so you've got less people in military, more technology. And that reflects, you know, the cost in military. There's one person called Philip Pugh, who, um, Philip Pugh predicted that in a certain time, the RAF would only be able to afford one aircraft on its budget that would be able to do lots of technical things. So the, the extrapolation of, of costs for military aircraft is, is something we're able to afford less and less kit for the same money. That's why you're getting less and less people and the world's changing because of technology. So technology maturity. There's some, there's some specific examples which might be of interest out of my, my kind of uh, experience. Uh, the first one, uncertainty, trying to get something to work, which was um, very ambitious, a very ambitious design uh, decision. Tried to get something to work, which was really difficult. Uh, the other one, I guess that, yeah, that's uncertainty in terms of technology maturity risk. So you must always monitor new technology because you don't know what it's going to do. I mean, you just have to look at Apple and Samsung, you know. They don't really know when things are going to work, but they do their best. And they end up reducing capability to get to market first. So technology is really difficult, especially software, things like that. Complexity, there was, um, when neural networks were being used for image recognition, they, uh, they tried to train an image recognition system with loads of vehicles in forests. And they found out it was, actually, it was actually the sky which was the main differentiator. So it was actually learning whether it was cloudy or blue sky or not. So it didn't really work at that stage. I think that was a common thing with neural network image recognition. So we could uh, attack a sky, an empty sky, if that was possible. And with these long project life cycles, you know, sometimes the bid stage of aircraft, they're finishing the design and lots of the electronics has gone obsolete in the design. They're no, lo no longer available from the manufacturer. So they have really um, difficult obsolescence management problems. So you have to manage, you have to manage obsolescence. I think this, this was something, this was a video which was shown by a risk manager from BA Systems in a training event saying, when we've got these new availability contracts, we've got to somehow predict the cost of things in 10, 20 years in terms of upgrade cycles, maintenance, reliability. It's, you know, it's really difficult. How can we manage this? So he, he used to show, hopefully this works, he used to show this video. This is how to predict the cost of a 20 year support contract. Oh, 
That was a difficulty in predicting something. In t <laughs> so the, the reason was if, that, if you try and what they're trying to do is to fulfil the requirement for 10 or 20 years in the future. So they're trying to manage a project to deliver for 10 or 20 years. So it's like it's like trying to hit a target, a very precise target, a long way away. It's very, very difficult. So we're going to kind of, during the project execution. Well, it can't, yeah, because before, I think, I think the thing was before, you had to they had to just manufacture equipment. And the, the, the Ministry of Defence would have warehouses of spares. But then they have to support something for, for 10 or 20 years. Sorry, there's a question. Absolutely. So it's in the, you'll see in the slides that the time value of money is really important. Indeed, I mean, the kind of costs we've got at the moment kind of invalidates historical cost data as comparison sometimes because the world is so unique at the moment in terms of... The world is so unique in terms of uh, how it is. And in cost estimating, we're in the business of, of drawing comparisons to make estimates. But inflation is, is actually the critical because you're... Inflation is a factor you apply to your costs, either to, to either uh, roll them forward or roll them backwards in time. You have to apply a year-on-year -year percentage factor to account for inflation. So if you've got the historical inflation, you can do that accurately going backwards. Going forwards is not so easy. Um, so you've seen that you know, there are different reasons for, for cost information. You, know, you see, we need costs for all sorts of particular reasons here. We've already talked about the impact of technology. Price negotiation with suppliers. Now, that, my colleague who works in automotive, that's, that's his thing. You know, he says, OK, you're going you're to charge me this for a, for a part of the engine. Break it down for me. You know, what's material? What's the labour? What's the overhead? What are the energy costs? And they can, you know, they can say no, but they, they tend to go on side and say okay. But what are we going to get in return? So a negotiation starts, and they get very clever. They start to say okay, you've told us your electricity costs are so much, or, or a certain percentage. If you break it down in terms of percentages, they say, well, how much profit are you making on this? How much labour is in there? how much electricity are you using? Then what they do is they go on the internet and look at the electricity prices for where the supplier is, Poland, Europe, could be anywhere, and they think, work out, okay, we think they're gonna use this amount of electricity to make this part, so they get a benchmark on the supplier, and they want to, what they tend to do is start to get intelligence on the supplier's costs, and go into a negotiation to say, well, we believe you're, over, you're overcharging, so therefore, so on the, on the customer side, you've got a should cost, should cost information. And on the, on the customer side, you've got this should cost this. On the supplier side, they've got their actual cost breakdown, which they, you know, they want to keep secret, secret. They've estimated the costs. Another classic situation is designing something. If you're designing something, let's say, you know, like a, a mechanical part, you're making decisions like putting holes in, putting features, chamfers, you know, what the geometries are, or what, what your sketch is, you know, if you, your constrained sketch if you use a computer-aided design system, different materials. So what you need is the implications of your decision for manufacturing. One of my colleagues once we used to work at, um, used to work at uh, GE, 
energy, which is in rugby. You know, they were in the factory and a design had come over from an inexperienced designer which had a sharp corner, which was very difficult to machine. So there's two poor decisions there which were adding cost. There was the sharp corner which required a really high precision machine tool and lots of time to machine and it also provided a stress point in the design as well but it cost a lot of money from a manufacturing point of view. So designers, they want cost information as well. So fundamentally, as a, cost, as a cost estimator, you're trying to make the best guess, the best guess possible with the information you've got available. So what does that mean? That means your whole estimating process depends on what information is in the company. Now that could be people, that could be data in an enterprise resource planning system, it could be in a spreadsheet somewhere, it could be contractor quotes in, in a, part of, a part of the company. Um, it could be cost information publicly available. Uh, in the construction industry, they have something called SPONS, which is publicly uh, published cost data or norms. In other words, it will, it will, the price of a pump is this. The effort it takes to install a pump is this. So SPONS is, um, is published, I believe, by Davis Langdon. I believe it's, that's the case. They're, they're a, a construction cost management consultancy. Um, I could be wrong. I'm sure they publish. But SPONS is, 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 very, is very famous. So, so you've got an enterprise resource planning system full of finance data and uh, at different levels of project definition. So what do you do? So to, to develop an estimate, you need, an estimating, you need an estimating process. You need a standard estimating process. And you know this because there are, there are examples of estimating processes in handbooks um, from different organizations from, from all around the world. So here's, here's a few examples of, of estimating processes. This one is from the Government Audit Office and is really quite complex. So there's all sorts of different things going on there, which we can come back to. But that's just an example for you to, to be able to look at later or analyse in some way, because that's quite complex. Something which is a bit easier to take on board is from the UK government, which involves these steps. You'll see an estimating process is always a slight variation, but you've got some basic steps. So you've got to engage people, you've got to develop a, an estimating team. Cost estimating is a, is a team sport. And you need to gather, gather data. You need to gather historical cost data and also cost driver data as well. Does anyone know what I mean by a, by a cost driver? Yes. So anything which, if it changes and the cost increases or decreases, I guess, then that's in principle a cost driver. So you can have cost drivers at different levels. Remember our levels of definition in a project. So you want to remember the project life cycle. So we can have a high level cost driver, like, um, like the weight of something, or its capability, its specification, like say the capacity of a stadium, or the payload of an aircraft, the number of people it carries, 
or its range, for example. So you increase the range of an aircraft, you tend to increase its cost, increase its weight. If you can increase its complexity, that's another cost driver. Sometimes people think about cost drivers in terms of, um, they think about uh, cost drivers at, at detailed levels. Remember the project plan, our network diagram, where we had the activities and the resources, and we built up a, a schedule. So sometimes people look at cost drivers at that level and say, well, labor is a cost driver because the more labor there is, the more cost it is. Or sometimes they say that the activity time is a cost driver. Or sometimes they say the material is a cost driver. That's the main cost. So sometimes people speak about cost drivers at a, at a detailed work package level in terms of things are high cost. So you can consider cost drivers at different levels of definition, at the high level of the project, the, the specification level, and also the work package level of the, of the project plan. I mean, if you talk to somebody in Jaguar Land Rover, they will say, if we know the material cost of our, of our design, we know, it's, we know it's about 50% of the vehicle cost, as a rule of thumb, based on our experience of building JLRs. Is it? Uh, okay, yeah, so it's important that someone is responsible for a cost estimate. So this is an important part of the estimating process. So that we're, we're going to be audited. Someone's going to come back in five years and said, this estimate was rubbish. What, what, what happened here? And so someone has to be responsible always. There has to be some sort of audit trail. So the project leadership sign-off is to say, yeah, we're happy with this. So there has to be some sort of control. Otherwise, people will, will do what they can or want to get things done on time. So it's very, it's very important. It, it, has another, it has all sorts of implications for who, who, will, who will be prepared to sign what in an estimate. So uh, it brings in the estimating as a team. Yes, exactly. So this is, the, this is the guessing the cost. This is predicting the cost at any, any stage of the project life cycle for any purpose. So look at the beginning, you need to talk about the purpose of the estimate. And we talked about that in terms of having different types of cost information. So here's another, here's another estimating process. Now this one's from NASA, which is a bit more technical. We well, can see, in essence, it's a similar same thing. You know, it's, uh, it's basically collecting data. It's def well, it, it's defining the estimate purpose at the beginning. What cost information are we trying to predict? Then we're kind of looking at the work breakdown structure or the project, the level of the project we're at in terms of definition. And then we start to develop the estimate in terms of estimating methods. And then we add, we add the uncertainty and risk in the end part. Now with any model, you always write down your assumptions. You might assume, for example, that there's no overtime. You might assume a technology will mature in time. You might assume that there's no problems in the design stage, for instance. You might assume contractors are available. So there's all sorts of assumptions you can make in building your estimate. So back to our... So the reason why I'm going through this is for you to, to discuss different estimating methods and also different types of cost. So in a project, there are, there are different types of cost, usually direct and indirect costs. Now that's a, that's a management, management accounting principle, whether something is direct or indirect. So it's like if you're working at the cold face. You know, you, you, if you're working directly on a project, you're direct labor. Um, if you're using materials to build something, 
it's direct materials. If you're hiring a machine to work solely on the project, that's a direct equipment and machinery. So they're your direct costs. Now anything else which is supporting the project, like the building it's been, it's been the project's taking place in, it might be sharing that building with other projects or business as usual. You might have things like human resources or training, which are also working with other projects and business as usual. The parking, the heating, the lighting of the building. All these things are termed indirect costs. Like so. So just for a few minutes discussion with your colleagues. If you're in the university, there's the, there's the example in the slides which is to do with the steelworks. But if you're in the university working on this quadcopter, what would be your direct and indirect costs? Just have a conversation with your fellows. I guess the Padlet doesn't work. So we're back to manual. So what do you think are direct and indirect costs? You can also think about the steelworks as well. Absolutely. Which type of which? If I was a supervisor, am I am I direct labour or percentage of my time to the university or the technician? Are they are they direct labour or are they overhead? So overhead and selling in general administration. So in any organisation, you've got people who are supporting. Think of them as supporting the organisation's function. So the technicians are always there to support different things. The buildings are here, the heating, the lighting, security, catering, car parking, all these different things are there, are there to, support, to support the projects. If we assume there's, there's many projects, and if we assume there's also business as usual, things which happen on an operational basis, non-project activity, then you begin to see that you either got people who are directly engaged on a project, who are adding value to the project, and people who are supporting the organisation. So you probably perhaps cost a technician at a percentage of his time as direct labour. You would cost my time as a percentage as direct supervision. However, the facilities, the buildings, the heating and lighting, would be a percentage cost. Yes, so that, that would be that would be a direct expense. The food. It would be the project budget. So the thing is, is that, is that there are, there's in overhead, um, what did you say? The, the catering, the... Yeah. So that would be direct consumables. So, I mean, a lot of the time, some, sometimes with overhead, it's the, it's the accounting rules. So if you, if you had a maintenance force in the, in the university who went around mending things, then that would be an overhead, although they would, they would, they would repair machines to keep your project going, but you'd class that as overhead. To keep it simple, keep it to direct labour time and direct materials and consider everything else as overhead. So if it, I can be I can be a percentage time on the project, but something like catering is is supporting the whole university. 
and there will be ways of trying to allocate that overhead, but it's still, it's still a supporting cost. There is a bit, there is grey areas around the edges where accountancy has tried to allocate overhead more precisely. But um, in general, in principle, you've got your direct labour, direct materials, and then you've got your supporting stuff. And you allocate it usually on the basis of labour hours. So if, you've got, if, you're doing, if you've got lots of labour in your project, you attract lots of overhead from the organisation to pay for everything, which you, know, you can imagine is quite, uh, is quite um, an inaccurate way of doing things. Because you can get distortions. You, know, you, you could have lots of labour but not use much overhead, and vice versa. You could have a little bit of labour but be using loads of overhead. But you wouldn't pay for it because you've only got a little bit of labour. So yeah, so, so usually, you know, there's the, uh, there's the simple thing of, of direct labour, direct material, and then the overhead costs. So there's a, there's a proper definition for us to, to look at. So I guess the, these, are, these are classic examples here, which are functions across the, uh, the organisation in general. The more general and removed from the project, the more likely it's going to be classic overhead definition. So before we go into cost estimating methods, do you want to have a five minute break? Just to have a bit of a brain rest. I was hoping the Padlet would have worked, it would have been a bit more, a bit more interactive. Yes, yes. So the if uh, I found a way of accessing the papers, if you just type, if you just go to, if you don't, if you don't type anything in the search term, but you put in year two, year two semester one for Mace, then it gives you all the exam papers from that semester. Because I think you have you have to put Mace two two four nine one as a search term. So that's the code. But if you just leave that search term blank, then you should be able to should be able to access all the papers, and the project management ones will be there. Is everyone okay? So I'll come back in about five past four. Start to start start again.
So we've seen, you know, we, we know we're developing, we're, we're developing cost estimates, developing cost information at different levels of accuracy. So remember our estimate at completion. Remember the estimate at completion was something we used earn value data to estimate. So remember that, that was something we did last week. The ROM estimate is your ballpark estimate and is usually based on a size driver. So if you were estimating the cost of uh, HS2, you'd be interested in how much track was going to be laid, how much electrified track was going to be laid. For example, um, anything related to the size of the project in terms of what it does. If you're estimating the cost of the A380, how many passengers it carries, what its wingspan is. If you're estimating the cost of a stadium, how many people is the stadium going to hold. Um, so a ROM estimate is like, they usually call it the back of a cigarette packet. You know, they look for the main cost driver at early project definition, at the early stages where you only know what the project is going to do and how big it's going to be, uh, what its benefits are going to be to society, things like that. Very high level, high level drivers lead to a ROM, a ROM estimate. So you also have, you can develop cost models and a classic cost model is the parametric cost model. So here's an example of a, a simple cost breakdown of let's say the materials cost this much, the labor hours are so much, then we have a charging rate, which is the direct labor rate plus the overhead. And then we, have, we calculate the labor cost via the labor hours here times the charging rate, which tends to be this direct labor plus overhead. Like so. And then, then you have a, 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 a risk happening a budget for risk and a profit. Yes. Or person person hours now. Yeah. So they will be direct labour. So remember when I said the, the overhead is, is, is recovered based on the number of labour hours. So that's why the overhead rate is, uh, is connected to labour. So the profit tends to be, you've got, you've got a market in which you're competing. So if, some, if you're charging more profit than everybody else, there's got to be a good reason for it at negotiation stages. But every contractor needs to take its profit. And it you know, depends on the going, the going price. Yeah, so it's, it depends. If you're, if you're a monopolistic supplier, if there's only you who does it, then your profit can be more. If, um, if, you're, if you're just getting nuts and bolts, say, fasteners, then there'll be a conventional market level profit expected. Because that will be a cost based competition, and people will be competing on being able to deliver a project at low cost, so they'll be trying to reduce their own costs. And maximize their profit using the going market rates for profit. A company won't pay more than the going market rate if, the, if there's lots of competition. So that means the suppliers have to reduce their costs internally to make more profit. They have some sort of target price which, which the market will support. So that means you know, they can only charge a certain price. So they have to reduce their costs 
to, uh, to increase their profit share in that number. So just coming back to the allocation of overheads. There's a bit more information there for you to look at later. So it's a simple calculation. Coming back to come back to the estimating techniques. So this is the I've shown you examples of, of cost estimating processes. But this is a, a simplified, straightforward one we're going to use. So remember, we do our, we do our breakdown structures. Um, and then we develop our performance measurement baseline. Remember, we did that for earned value. So we, we, we developed the network diagram. We looked at the resource loading and the timing of activities. And we developed our performance measurement baseline as used in project control. So our process typically has a data collection and data analysis step. So we've already, we already know we're going to collect data from all sorts of places, historical cost data. And then we're going to determine cost estimating techniques. We're going to use a method to estimate the cost. So the, the ones which I'm going to cover next. And then you've got this model development and validation. So what you have to do, you have to test your estimate with your colleagues. So you have to do some sort of check of accuracy. Either you might check it against historical data, does it make sense? Or you talk to your estimating team and colleagues and ask them to validate things. Now, do, does this seem reasonable? Have I made any mistakes in logic? And then you, you, can, you kind of create the results in a, usually in a spreadsheet and report the result to management. So what you would tend to do is you would have a meeting, you'd have the project manager, you'd have, you would have the actual part of the project being managed as well, maybe the, the product manager or the subsystem manager. You would have maybe a stress engineer, asset integrity. We'd all be in the same room, you would have all taken part in the estimating process and if it was me I'll, I'll be presenting my process, what I did at each stage, I would have the, you know, the, the network diagram, the performance measurement baseline, I'd have all the data, I'd have all the people I'd talk to, the minutes of the meetings, I would have cost data, I'd have cost driver data, maybe from the CAD system, maybe from contractor quotes, maybe from interviews. You know, I might be sat opposite. If you were engineers in a project, I'd be asking you, okay, what's driving the cost in this project? It would be a conversation where we would use engineering judgment to try and identify a cost driver. Then I would, you know, show the results of using my estimating methods. I would show them the results of validation, how I tested my results with other projects. You know, I would have a written report in an Excel spreadsheet. I'd have a basis of estimate in that report. And that, that's how things would go. And we would have the sign-off as well, the team, the team leader sign-off. Everyone signed off everything. I agree with this. He did say this. We did do this. This data is from me on this date. You have all these sign-offs as well. So we've already seen the, the work breakdown structure as input. Then we would start to include AED. Does anyone know what AED stands for? No. Assumptions, exclusions, and dependencies. So you write down anything you've assumed you know, I've assumed there's no overtime. I've assumed, I've assumed that it will be a certain level of reliability. 
I assume that uh, it's, it's under normal conditions of work. There'll be no, there'll be no fatigue. I've assumed different things. So you do those things to simplify, to simplify your cost estimate. Exclusions. You say, okay, the cost. This cost estimate does not include overhead, or this cost estimate does not include um, the assembly cost, which is done by a contractor. For example, so you put in your e exclusions, what is excluded, also what is included. So you're very clear about what is in the cost estimate. And you also have dependencies. So this depends on the weight estimate for the aircraft. If the weight estimate changes, then the cost will change. Or this depends on having a high quality supplier. This depends on so you write down these things in words. You have to write this down, what you assume, what you exclude, and what this depends on. And all this information generates a basis of estimate. You, know, you basically write down all this stuff you're doing into a basis of estimate. And I've got an example here to make things clear. At least I should have. I did have. I uh, will have. Let's see. It's my master's teaching. So I'll share, I'll share this with you later. We, you tend to just write everything down like that. You write everything down, and that's your audit. So then, KPMG, um, or Atkins, or whoever the consultancy is, comes in and looks at your basis of estimate. And this is when, I don't know, a year later, two years later, somebody knocks on your door. Hello? So, the cost is overrun by 70%. Where's the basis of estimate? What happened? You know, so, so you write everything down, just like you would do in any scientific experiment. You have a basis of, of things. I'll share that with you at the end of the lecture. I'll put on, on Pro Blackboard. So maybe we go back to this one. So all data collected should be comparable. So it should be in the same year. Remember that example? You know, if, if I'm using historical cost data from 1980, then I have to add the inflation year on year to get it to the right level of cost for this year, for example. So you have to normalize your data. Would you, would you compare the cost of a student project with a Northrop Grumman Hawk? No, you couldn't do that. You, you, you'd have to delete, delete the inappropriate cost examples you're using in your estimate because they're not comparable. They're not comparable in terms of complexity. Exactly. That's a that's a classic example. But really, what you're trying to do is just make things comparable. You want to compare apples with apples. You want to remove as much sources of variation in your comparison as possible, especially for parametric. So you want to use the most convenient technique. You can either have analogy detailed or, or parametric. So coming back to my examples I'm going to share later. So this is an example of estimating by analogy. This is a high pressure, a high pressure valve trying to estimate the cost of for National Grid at the beginning as part of the planning process for the period 
2021 to 2026. This was happening in 2018, 2019. We knew there were about 200 of these valves and they all needed repairing. And the company had only done two in the past. And we knew that each valve was really complex, was really different from every other valve, was in different places like North London, East Anglia, East Anglia where there's lots of farmland and verges and grass, London where there's lots of streets, um, built over areas, complexity, real high penalties for traffic management. You know, if you stop the traffic in London you really are starting to pay good money. Um, if you stop the trains uh, for uh, if, you, if you stop the trains at Network Rail, it could cost you £1 million for a, for, a, for a period of weeks if you stop the trains for a, a few hours at uh, King's Cross Station to do some work on uh, utilities, it would cost you about a million pounds to pay National Grid because they... Sorry, Network Rail. <laughs> Sorry. Because he, what, what, what they do, they, they call it, they call it um, possession of tracks. You know, the, if, you, if you take over the tracks to do some work because you've got a pipe going over the top of the tracks or you've got something right next to the railway station which makes things unsafe when you're working, then you have to so-called incur possession time of, of network rail tracks. And that can be very expensive at King's Cross where there's, there's a, a kind of price system you know, they've got a price system of people pay to use the tracks to move passengers and move, move bits of goods and stuff. And that, uh, they have to pay network rail to use the tracks. So if you stop network rail making money, you have to pay that money to network rail. So that's a major, what we would call a cost driver. It would be like one of these lower level cost drivers, you know, an actual, because possession time is a large cost. So it's one of those types of cost drivers. But because there was only two examples and we needed to estimate the cost of 200, and we're at the early planning stages, we're at the early stage of a, of a, you know, a project to repair 200 high pressure valves at umpteen meters beneath the ground around the UK, there's no way we could do a detailed, accurate estimate for that. It's just too we just wouldn't have the time and effort and information to do that. So you'd simply do an analogy, which is basically you look at what you have got, which is one or two data points, and you would either say, okay, that's it, that's the cost for each 200. We can't say anything more about it. We don't have the information. We're gonna tell the customer that, you know, the estimating requirement, there's a lot of uncertainty in our estimate. So that's, that's the best we can do. If we were to do a detailed estimate for each one, we'd have to survey each valve, we'd have to do a detailed engineering breakdown of work, it would just be preclusive. Exactly. So. You get, you get all sorts of behaviour at bidding stages. There's a so-called conspiracy of optimism. In, in mega projects, um, there's, there's a, uh, an academic called Flevberg, his name is from Oxford, who basically says uh, you've got people lying to, to the government, to the customer, to get the project, to get it moving, like large transport systems. Because as soon as they get the contract, it's very difficult to take it off them. But they'll make it work, they'll try and make it work, but they will deceive and uh, say it's going to cost them less. You also get, in less complex projects, you get entryism, where people are trying to get into a market and they'll take the hit. They'll come in at a lower price, they will take the hit to get more work later. So there is a, a kind of bidding strategy to enter into a certain market. Say so if you're a water company, you would try and get into this by charging less. But eventually you lose as a, as a customer's national grid because you want a safe, high quality supplier because your low, your low bidding suppliers will cause you loads of problems. 
eventually. But in the short term, they can say, OK, we've spent less. So there is a game going on. Yes, exactly. People, people do that, yeah. It's, it's a market-driven market thing. There's a similar thing, there's a similar costing system for missiles. If, if you're estimating the cost of a missile for MBDA, then what you would do is you would look at your database of missiles, and they're all so different and complex, you would pick the most similar one, and that would be your estimate to the MOD. But you'd be clear about that, that there's a lot of uncertainty in this estimate. So you could use analogy, but it won't be very accurate. Um, you could use parametric, which is your... Um, as scientists, you've probably done line of best fit before now. Have you done line of best fit, regression analysis, which is a statistical technique? I think you might do that in year two, year three, I don't know, for statistics. So re regression analysis is quite, a, it's quite an involved technique because it, it, it includes the F test and the T test for um, and things like uh, standard error and different things like that, which are statistics and probability. That's more of a third year course, or later on in your second year. But essentially, what you would do for a parametric is you would collect more data than just one in your analogy. And this is where your normalization is important because you want this data to be as comparable as possible. So if, if all these were aircraft, then you want, you want a comparable set of aircraft. You want them all to be civil airliners. You don't want any fighter aircraft in there or something like that, because they're completely different you know, in terms of complexity and technology and all sorts of things. So you want as hom homogeneous a data set as possible. You want all the data to be in the same year, so adjusted to be in the same year. Similar complexity, maybe similar purpose, because the more comparable your data, the better your estimate. I mean, sometimes in the aviation industry, there's a, there's a thing called learning curve. And learning curve is uh, that if you, track, if you track your unit cost of an aircraft, as you spend on making different aircraft, the first aircraft off the production line is expensive. By the time you'll make, you've made your 30th aircraft, you've just got better at making the aircraft, and it's a lot less expensive. So if this was for aircraft, you'd want the same number off the production line as comparison. So you'd want that, them all to be the 30th off the production line, because there's such a difference between your first aircraft cost and your 30th because of manufacturing improvements learning cycles, all these different things, cost reductions. So a classic normalization is to keep all the data in aviation to the same, the same number off the production line. So your, your parametric is, is finding the most, heter most homogeneous data set, normalized, and put a line of best fit through it. And then you would extrapolate, you would then use that as an estimate. So I guess, would you say that's more accurate than analogy? More or less? There's more information in there, isn't there? There's more comparison. There's more homogeneity. So I guess, in general, it's going to be, it's going to be somewhat, a little bit, you know, it's going to be more accurate as a rule of thumb, but not necessarily. Okay, we've been through that. So, and the final estimating technique is your is your detailed technique. So that's your bottom up technique. So that's that's when you've got all the information from your project plan, from your performance measurement baseline. So that's when you've got all your activities, all your resources. And they're all visible, and you can, you know the, the amount of labour, you know what the charging rates are, you know what the materials are, you've got all that detailed information, and you can build your estimate up.
from, from the ground up, so-called ground up estimating. So in that sense, they, they are the estimating techniques. And you know, the, the top down tend to be, you know, they, they tend to be at the early stages of project life cycle. So they tend to operate on high level cost drivers or high levels of the, the higher level granularity. So, so they're kind of, they're quick and easy or they're easier. You know, you're basing your estimate on, uh, on historical cost data. But there is a lot of uncertainty in, in the uh, top-down estimating, like in allergy and parametric. You know, there's a lot of uh, subjectivity in processing data, in choosing data, in normalization. There's a lot of subjective judgment going in, which I hope you would record in your assumptions, in your basis of estimate. Or you've got the ground up, you know, you've got the detailed estimate. Now the thing is, with a, with a detailed estimate, you know, you, you can be very specific about the hours, but uh, you can get these small errors aggregating through all, all this fine detail. Now, hopefully they balance out, but if not, they can aggregate. It is possible. And people have to build these things on, on spreadsheets, and they make mistakes. You know, they kind of, there's so many numbers in there, there's so many calculations that they can make silly errors that might get past the audit process so it is, it is possible now the thing about the thing about your detailed estimate is what do you think you know what, what's what's advantageous about your detailed estimate it's very visible isn't it if you if you go to see the the manager who says the book stops here and you show him your detailed estimate on a spreadsheet, you can say, oh, I can see this, yes, I agree. Yeah, I, I can, my mortgage is safe next year, I can see where all this is coming from. Whereas if you go to your manager with a, with a, a statistical analysis, a parametric, he's going to say, oh, what data did you choose and why? What, what statistics did you do? Are you sure this is right? I, how uncertain are we about this? What's the new project look like? Is it comparable? You can see there's a lot of uncertainty in there. Your manager's starting to worry about his mortgage and his car a bit too much. So um, you've, got to be, uh, you've got to be mindful of the, of, the, of the strengths and weaknesses. So that's reflected here. That's reflected in your project life cycle on what type of estimating method is used. So you can see you kind of start off with analogy and parametric. The parametric lives a bit long into the project life cycle because it's got more data. Your build up, your build up is kind of this side where all the data becomes available. And you're starting to get actuals in your project. So you can start to extrapolate actual data as your estimate. So it kind of makes sense that you do your different techniques across the project life cycle. So for, for five minutes, could you discuss what estimating technique you would use with your colleagues, just for a few minutes? And then I've got an example of which estimating techniques are used in different parts of an AV, UAV, just as, a, uh, just as an example.
Yep, yeah, so it could be any of analogy, parametric, detailed, extrapolation from actuals. You might even think about three-point estimating as well, whether you model uncertainty. Either, either. I don't mind. Yeah, sorry, that's then we will compare. Yeah, that's the... I can't, I can't uh, blame predictive text for that one. That is, that is me typing too fast. Sorry. Yeah, so just to just discuss these techniques, um, which in your UAV project, which ones will be more appropriate than not? Because then you get some sort of processing. You would, you would try and use as many techniques as you can. In, ter in terms of cost assurance, if you could use two different techniques and then look at the comparison, it would strengthen your validation. Yeah, yeah. So you, you would, because you're, you need cost information for different things during the project life cycle. So for your decision making at the beginning, um, in terms of say design, or, uh, or early level planning, or optioneering, in terms of which way you're going, in terms of what the project's going to do, or what it's going to look like, then you need more top down estimating, because your cost drivers um, are very high level, your project definition is quite granular. So analogy and parametric kind of makes sense. You always have subject, subject matter judgment as well. So you've got an expert or a set of experts who will give you the answer based on their experience. So, and as you go further and you've got a more detailed plan, then you're in a better position to do a detailed estimate. So sometimes you have parts of the project plan are still parametric, others are more detailed depending on how much definition you've got in your work breakdown structure, how much definition you've got in your plan. Remember, there are, there are planning packages where you've still not decided in detail what you're going to do later on in the project. So you'll perhaps use analogy and parametric for those planning packages. So, so parts of your project you can't really detail plan until you've completed other parts of the project, especially true on long life cycle where you've got uncertainty, um, typically like a ship or something like that. But from a cost assurance perspective, you want to try, so you might combine subject matter judgment with a parametric and see if there's any major discrepancy. And it's a good way of maintaining the conversation in the estimating team about validity of the estimate as well. 
and you'd record that in the basis of your estimate. So you'd, you'd do all these things to improve the quality of estimating. It's quite, it's quite a difficult, difficult thing to do, but it's a, it's a really important thing to do as well, uh, which is why you need the sign-off part in the, in the estimating process. Yeah, yeah. So if you, I guess that would be the responsible manager. So they, they need to be happy as well. There's a lot of information here I'm giving you which is um, above and beyond the, some, of the, some of the PowerPoint material, but that's just to give you more background. Okay. Just um, can I can I come back to that uh, about the content of the? I have to make an announcement about that. I think about content of week nine. So this is this is from from I think the initial document I put up in week one about UAVs, and it just shows some of the type of estimating methods which are used for those type of work packages. So I guess your, like your training can be more bottom up. Your air vehicle tends to be quite parametric -y. And these things. So that's, that's a work breakdown structure type example. But it really depends on what stage of the project life cycle you're at. So data collection can be difficult because you might have no data. Um, you might find that your data is in a different part of the company and you have to, you have to know the people there to make sure to know that it actually exists. For example, and you need to know that your data is sufficient quality. It's not maybe someone's just written something down from somewhere. So there needs to be some level of validity. It needs to, needs to come from some sort of uh, quality, quality source. And you have to do estimating. It has to be on time. So in terms of any estimate which is late is, is not really of any use to anyone. So you have to give the best guess with the information which you've got available. Now coming back to our time value of money, this is an example where you can see it's important to know when you're going to spend money. So remember when we said the purpose of cost information sometimes in the project is about cash flow. So when you spend money is important because you can see here where You've got the same, you've got the same budget, but it's been spent in different different times. So depending on when you spend it means because of inflation that the actual value is different. Remember, if I, if I bought something in 1970, it would cost a whole lot more in 2020, thinking about house, house, prices, house prices now. So when you spend your money because of inflation, really impacts, impacts the final value. So time phase budget is really important. So finally for today, we're talking about now the, we've covered three point estimating before. So we're talking about the impact of risk 
risk and uncertainty. And maybe the best way of showing you this is, is via a software, a software package called At Risk. Yes, uh, yes. So, I, uh, So if I just if I just put um, simple labour materials, let's say over overhead costs, let's see. And let's say there's a risk cost here as well, a risk event. Like so, of, if the risk happens, it will cost a thousand pounds. So let's see, these are our costs. Yeah, yeah. So it can be, yeah, we do risk in week. Hang on. Next week, I think. No, the week after next. Can we? So. Wait, this is week number six, right? Yeah, yeah. So risk is, I think, week seven, week eight. Just to check. Might be quality first. Let's see about that. So, so in, 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 a, in our in our single point world, where there's no you know there's no probability, then that would be that would be our estimate. Let's say like so. I would use I'd sum everything up like that. Right, so, but in our three-point world, we have to, we have actually a, a, an uncertainty distribution, probability. So what that means is, is that I start to, def I start to fit distributions instead of numbers. So I'm starting to use probabilistic costs. So this is just for demonstration purposes to give you a bit more of a, an insight into this thing, but instead I, I would, for simplicity I'll keep it symmetric, like so I'll use the defaults, so I can start to turn these into distributions with a range, they wouldn't all be the same um, if we had more time to develop this. Now the thing with a risk event is, it either happens or it doesn't. So this is what's called a Bernoulli distribution. What distribution? So it's a, it's a Bernoulli. How would you spell that? So that's a B-E-R-N-O-U-L-L-I. Huh. So, it, so, it, so it's either a one or a zero. It either exists or it doesn't. And if, it, if it's a zero, then it doesn't matter because it's zero times the impact. So it's, if, it, if, it, if it's a one, then it's one times the impact. And the one has a probability of happening. 
and the zero is the one minus the probability of it happening. So your classic Bernoulli, Bernoulli type stuff, which is a discrete probability, you can see there it either it's a yes, no, or an on or an off. So it's a zero or a one. So Bernoullis are used quite a lot in science. So let, let's say that let's say there's a 0.9 chance of this risk happening which means there's a 0.1 of it not happening. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't add any cost, so it's a zero. Like so, we call, it, we call this the output. Final cost is the output. Like so. So now we should be able, I've converted these into distributions and I've put this down as a, as a risk event, as a Bernoulli, it's either happens or it doesn't, with a £1,000 impact. So I should be able to, I've got a thousand iterations here at the top, so I should be able to just press start simulation. Oh, there we go. And that's what our cost, cost risk output would look like. So it builds up a histogram of a thousand scenarios. Because you have a thousand scenarios running. So it simulates a project a thousand times based on probabilities and comes out with a frequency distribution of cost. Like this. So that's your, that's your Monte Carlo. So estimating uncertainty is all about, in practice, guessing these distributions and guessing the probability of the risk event to come up with your cost risk output. So that's the, the cost risk uncertainty bit. You can, now I, I could have this as a, as a report, like so, and, and I, I could include the... And also, Mr. Dr. Lightly, I don't think you're using the microphone right now. Oh. Is that better? <laughs> so, um, Sorry if this embarrassed you. No, it's okay. I'll oh, have to call this a different one. Yeah, of course. Let me just. Um, I mean, that, that, that's, that's, the fi that's the final distribution. So you've got a cumulative distribution there. Which, and then you've got, the, you've got the, the probability distribution and you've got the cumulative. So coming back to that point, so here is your, these are the triangular distributions which we, which we defined over here. So we have to, remember we have to guess at the three points, the optimistic, the most likely and the pessimistic. And that tends to be quite subjective. Um, so, so there's a lot of subjective matter judgment can go into that, or you could base it on historical historical data somehow. So instead of instead of single numbers, we have probability distributions, and we have this we have this event which may or may not happen, and we kind of model that using a discrete Bernoulli, which is a zero or a one. So if it doesn't happen, then it has a value zero, which kind of is good for us in our model because it just times it, times the impact by zero and it didn't happen so there's no cost so that's perfect whereas if it does happen then it times the impact by one and that's that's good so that's we just want an as is so a discrete Bernoulli variable is a specialized type of probability distribution which you would use in at risk like so and you know we've got the simulation results So that's, that's the frequency distribution of a thousand iterations, a thousand simulations. So there was probably one of those simulations was a very low cost. A um, few of the simulations are very high costs. And why is that? Why do you think that is? So that, that's because our, our distributions, it's a low probability that the, that the uh, at the high end because the triangular so the the high range 
is of low probability, so only a few of these scenarios will include the high probabilities together, because it will be, it's a low probability of that happening. So that's because of our algorithm, which is generating the, generating the scenarios based on the probability information. Now that's beyond our course to, to, to try and delve into the detail of those algorithms. So well that, that's, that's three point estimating in practice. And it gives you more, just a bit, well, it gives you more, it gives you more meaning behind these things now. Where you can see that, yes, single point does ignore optimistic and pessimistic. It doesn't consider a range or quality of input data. It doesn't provide any measure of uncertainty. These things are all true. Whereas the three-point estimating does include the minimum, does include the maximum and the most likely. I remember my explanation of three-point estimating in the tutorial, where we start to say, okay, what, what, it couldn't possibly be higher than this. It couldn't, in all probability, be, be lower than this. To set the range, like so. So you can see that, that risk, which we will cover in another lecture, it tends to be a specific event. It's driven, it may or may not happen. Whereas uncertainty, its source is a variation. It's because you're unsure about something. You can't say for sure. You can only talk about a range and a most likely. So risks have a, have a, a different nature than uncertainty. Risk is something which may or may not happen. Like your journey to the university, you know, time will happen. You will get to the university, you're just unsure of how long it takes you to get here. Whereas a risk is like a puncture on your bike or the bus breaking down. It may or may not happen. And if it does, there's an impact. So a risk is something which may or may not happen with an impact, like a puncture, bus breaking down, um, you know, real obvious events like that. There could be a crash, blocking the road. Doesn't happen every day. Whereas all the other things you're unsure about contributes to your uncertainty, your lack of knowledge, and your, your random statistical knowledge contributes to there being a range of times it takes you to get to university every day. No, it's just, a, it's just a source of uncertainty, it's variation because of random, random effects and lack of knowledge. Whereas a risk, you can pin it down to a specific event, like so. So that's it for today. I tried to make it a lot more interactive this time. My, my, my mission is to make these sessions more and more interactive. But my Padlet let me down. So I, I <laughs> you live and learn. Mentimeter is a lot better. Well, maybe we'll go back to Mentimeter next week. Yeah, it's, it's maybe better for, for smaller, smaller classes where I can give out a, a login or something. Or alert everyone to... We do have a site license, you see, for, for Padlet. I just didn't realise. And also, what's the lecture five going to be about? I just want to get my notes ready. Say again? Next week's lecture. Risk and risk management. So, let's just look at... Uh, there's the learning curve calculator, by the way, just for reference. Just to, just so you, you can calculate the cost of a 30th aircraft. Uh, where's the... It's either... I'll, I'll make the lecture notes visible either today or tomorrow. It's either risk or it's quality. You don't need to yourself too much. I'll do that. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Is everything okay? Is that, is that a good lecture? Yeah. 
Okay. I'm trying to make these more interactive, you see. I wanted, wanted to make it as interesting as possible. So I, I try interactive things and I try to give you like shaggy dog stories, you know, kind of like war wounds. Okay, so you want, okay. Yes, you know, I, I realise that sometimes it's, sometimes you try to say too much. Yeah, yeah. No, it's useful. It's useful feedback. I'm building up a portfolio of feedback because I want to home in on the optimal activities. So it's really important that I get feedback from you. In fact, I might ask for some feedback at some point during this week or just to get some interim things to, to hone in on the best, uh, best way of uh, interacting. Good. <laughs> Yep. Yep. No, so yeah. You should be able to access the. Uh, I'll I'll make visible the uh, the previous MCQs for practice. Yes. Um, I would have to check on that. I think, yes, you should be able to revisit. Be consistent, yeah, be consistent as the... Yes. Sorry, go on. Okay. Could, could you drop me an email so I can collect these things together? Yeah. Is that okay? Excellent. Is everyone else busy? What's, what's, are the, the students watch podcasts nowadays too much? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. I try my best.